Hello, I'm Alyssa Essman. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Horticulture and Crop Science at Ohio State, and I also serve as the State Extension Specialist in Weed Science uh, with responsibilities in the areas of corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, forages, and pasture systems. And so today I'll be talking about an interesting topic, which is when cover crops become weeds. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the benefits of cover crops, why we use them, and how they suppress weeds, uh, and also situations where they actually become the weed themselves. Cover crops are used for a number of reasons. A lot of times when growers are surveyed, one of the top reasons reported for using cover crops is some sort of soil health or soil preservation benefit. Uh, so cover crops are those that are planted kind of outside the rotation of a cash crop, right? And a time when the field would otherwise otherwise be vulnerable to things like wind and rain erosion. And so they protect the soil uh, and in doing so, you know, reduce soil erosion. Uh, they can take up nutrients that were maybe applied during the growing season to decrease some of those nutrient losses from the system. They contribute uh, matter into the soil and can build organic matter in the soil system. They can improve infiltration of water down into the soil uh, and most notably, you know, for the purposes of this presentation, uh, and oftentimes kind of that in that second tier of reasons why growers report using cover crops is that they can actually be pretty effective in suppressing weeds. And, and they do this in a number of ways. Kind of the top reason or way in which cover crops suppress weeds is through physical suppression, right? Uh, so the goal is to generate a lot of above ground uh, matter, and in doing so, we create almost this mulch type layer on top of the soil surface that hinders the germination and growth of our weed species. Uh, when cover crops are living, they can compete with weeds for things like light nutrients, water, and space. Um, certain cover crop species can actually produce chemical compounds uh, that can inhibit the germination and growth uh, especially of uh, smaller seeded species. We call this allelopathy. The termination that we do of our cover crops, things like chemical termination, uh, mowing and tilling also control weeds at that time. And in general, they can also alter the soil, uh, alter the seed environment, right? So they influence things like soil moisture, temperature, light and pests right around those germinating weed seeds. And when it comes to the suppression of weeds by cover crops, there's kind of two main drivers or two uh, main considerations or things we can try to do to improve the suppression of weeds. And one of these is biomass, right? Or the amount of above ground matter that we're generating uh, with our cover crop kind of on a pound per acre basis, right? And a lot of studies have shown uh, that as we increase cover crop biomass, we decrease uh, weed populations and decrease the variability in weed suppression, right? So it's a more consistent influence uh, or reduction in weeds, the higher biomass. And we see that on this graphic here. As we increase uh, biomass production, right, we decrease the variability in weed suppression, right? So as biomass increases, uh, early season weed biomass is less variable and lower. And then kind of the second and maybe um, less well-known factor that is also important in the suppression of weeds by cover crops is actually ground cover, right? Or the area of the ground that is either shaded out uh, or has that mulch layer that we talked about on top of the soil surface. So here we have a graphic showing a uh, percent cover crop ground cover 10 weeks after planting uh, related to the population decrease percentage of horseweed at the time of burn down, right? And we can see that as cover crop ground cover increases, we also have a greater decrease in the percent uh, of the population present at the time of our burn down. You know, and this is significant, obviously, for the purposes of weed management, but also when we think about herbicide resistance management, right? Cover crops suppress weeds, and in doing so, they reduce both the size and number of weeds present. In terms of herbicide resistance management, what this means is that if we have a lower weed density at the time of a post application, right, we have less weeds that are being exposed to our herbicides, then a less chance that we're selecting that one individual within a population 
uh, with a naturally occurring resistance. We also have smaller weeds. Uh, oftentimes when we use cover crops to suppress weeds, and what this does is it gives us a longer window of control uh, you know, for effective herbicide applications. It gives us flexibility in our post-herbicide application timing. For the reasons mentioned, cover crop adoption has been on the rise. There's a lot of interest in both cover crops uh, from the grower's perspective and from the researcher's perspective for things like soil health and weed suppression, right? In the past couple uh, USDA census uh, reports from 2012 and 2017, we see an increase in the use of cover crops nationwide. And as we mentioned, part of this purpose is for integrated pest management. Right, this idea that we have many small hammers and we're tackling this problem uh, being herbicide resistance in our weed population through the use of biological, cultural, mechanical, and chemical control options. Right, so of all the strategies that we can use in an integrated system, cover crops is one of those many small hammers needed for managing herbicide resistant weeds for the reasons that we talked about. One thing that can come up uh, in cover crop management is this concern over, you know, the species that we're using as cover crops and their potential to actually become weeds, right? Uh, and there's a couple of different instances uh, where this is specifically a concern. So cover cropping introduces a lot of management decisions into a cropping system, right? We have to think about what species we're going to use, how we're going to terminate it, what kind of the goal of the system is. We have to consider, you know, the herbicides that we're applying in season and what those might do to our fall planted cover crops, right? And in general, the time and management uh, just becomes more complex. And one of these considerations is, you know, the potential for the cover crops that we're using for the purposes of weed suppression to actually become weeds themselves. And there's a couple concerns here, right? <clears throat> Instances where cover crops can become weeds include situations where the cover crop wasn't fully terminated, right? If we don't get an adequate kill in the spring, either before or after our cash crop planting, that living cover crop might compete with the current cash crop uh, and might have you know, influences on yields in that case. Another concern uh, of when cover crops might become weeds and self is when they're actually allowed to produce seed, right? In producing seed, they're contributing to the soil seed bank and competing with future cash crops as weeds in future years, right? So depending on the situation, whether it's uh, a termination issue, we can have an impact both in the current growing season and also future growing season. Um, and you know, the goal of cover cropping is to provide weed suppression and not really introduce new weeds into the system. Oftentimes, uh, when we talk with growers, one of the biggest concerns about using cover crops is this termination factor, right? We're using a cover crop, uh, and unless we have a winter kill situation, right, something like oats where we plant them in the fall and they die naturally over the winter, we do have to consider how we're going to terminate or kill this cover crop either before or at planting or shortly thereafter. Um, it really requires the right method at the right time. The right method and time for termination will depend on, you know, the cover crop species, what growth stage they're at, the goals of the cover crop, uh, and a lot of times also the comfort of the grower. Uh, sometimes, you know, maybe there's a high tolerance for a lot of biomass, and sometimes growers don't want that much biomass at or around the time of planting, and a lot of that uh, depends on personal preferences. One big consideration uh, in terms of both herbicide efficacy and just the ability to get into the field to make our termination uh, applications is weather, right? Inclement weather in the spring uh, is an increasing issue across uh, much of the U.S. and can complicate how we can terminate our cover crops. Uh, kind of a trend in cover cropping right now is this idea of planting green or planting into a living cover crop uh, and terminating the cat planting into a living cover crop and then terminating that cover crop either at planting or shortly thereafter, right? This has shown to have a lot of benefits for biomass production. Termination timing uh, is one of those factors that tends to have a really high influence on how much biomass we produce, right? We talked about how important that is for weed suppression, 
Uh, but that can also complicate termination when we think about the fact that, you know, some species have to be terminated by a certain growth stage to be really effective. And when we get into those later maturity stages of the cover crop, termination can be a lot more difficult. Kind of the second issue we've mentioned uh, is seed production, uh, either of, you know, the seed that we plant initially uh, or of the seed that germinated and grew as a cover crop. And one of the issues and things that's talked about here uh, is this concept of hard seed. What that term means is that, you know, the seed has a coat that's pretty impermeable to water. Um, that means a certain percentage of that seed that's initially planted for a cover crop will actually stay in the soil and germinated uh, and can become a problem or, you know, emerge in growing seasons thereafter, right? So there's a certain number of species that comes with the risk that we're introducing this hard seed or seed that won't probably germinate right away to the seed bank. Uh, and this comes up when we talk about certain clover, medic, and veg species especially. The second issue that kind of ties into the termination issue is this idea of maturity, right? Uh, the longer we let these cover crops grow, especially if we have really great growing conditions and we run the risk of letting these cover crops go to seed in season is that those cover crops will contribute their seed to the seed bank, right? And so not only is that cover crop potentially competing with the cash crop in the growing, current growing season, uh, but that seed in future years can come back uh, and grow in a time when it's not necessarily desired. When we think about issues with termination or seed production, uh, there's a couple species of concern that I think it's really important to mention here. One of these is annual ryegrass. Um, Sometimes ryegrass is used colloquially for a number of different species, but here we're talking about annual ryegrass, sometimes also called Italian ryegrass, Olea multiflorum, right? Not to be confused uh, with cereal rye. This species, uh, you know, is popular in some regions, but it's not necessarily recommended for use as a cover crop by weed scientists. You know, some of the, the uh, biological characteristics that make annual ryegrass really great as a cover crop, thinking fast establishment, uh, you know, really great root systems, also makes it a really aggressive species that can very easily escape chemical control. Because of this kind of aggressive weedy nature, uh, it's not necessarily recommended. And where we do use it as a cover crop, we really want to exercise caution and make sure we are terminating this uh, by an appropriate growth stage. So, uh, one of the second species here that comes up is hairy vetch, and this is largely based on the amount of hard seed it produces. Right, so hairy vetch uh, can actually shatter this early in the season, can also be planted. When we put out our vetch, about 10 to 20 percent can remain ungerminated in the soil, meaning we've essentially introduced uh, this potential weed into the cropping system uh, that might be an issue in future years. Uh, as for termination, uh, there's some guidelines we can generally follow, uh, and I'll provide some resources for more specific information uh, soon after. So in general, the grass cover crop species are most effectively terminated with something like glyphosate alone or with saflofenacil. Broadleaf cover crops are most consistently terminated with mixtures of glyphosate uh, and 2,4-D, dicamba, or saflofenacil. Like we discussed, deciding when and how to terminate is one of the most important management decisions when making uh, cover crop management decisions, right? Uh, and, you know, it's really important to not only think about the goals of the cover crop, uh, personal preferences, the weather considerations, you know, but we also want to make sure we're consulting with our insurance providers because some of them have really specific guidelines for requirements. Uh, and it's important to confirm, you know, the termination options and requirements uh, in your operation. If you're looking for more specific information about the use of cover crops in general, but specifically with regard to the management of weeds, uh, there's a number of fact sheets uh, available. So these are cover crops for weed management, uh, thinking about species selection, uh, establishment of that cover crop, both timing and methods, uh, cover crops termination, and also herbicide persistence and carryover from cash crops.
There's a lot of really great weed management information out there about cover crops and other integrated strategies on our OSU Weeds website, uh, through the corn newsletter, a number of social media sites that'll be pictured on the next slide. Uh, the War Against Weeds podcast has been a really great, fun, collaborative effort between Sarah Lancaster at Kansas State, Joe Eichley at North Dakota State, and myself at Ohio State. Uh, each week, we bring on experts and talk about you know anything related to the management of weeds. There's also a number of groups that have come together uh, to provide all sorts of weed management information. One is Take Action, uh, specifically thinking about resistance management in weeds. The Crop Protection Network is a great resource uh, thinking about all things pest management. Uh, and the Grow Network is very focused on integrated strategies for weed management. For more questions about this topic or the management of weeds, feel free to reach out to me uh, at this email or visit our website. And we can also be found on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube.